Um, next, we've now talked to platforms, we've talked to content producers, and we've talked to brands. Let's near talk, now talk about audiences. Internationalization of content, as we all know, means so many different things. Historically, in many regions, it's meant the import or successful import of content. But increasingly, we're seeing the rise of export of content, whether it's in big niches like K-drama and anime, or in sort of more mass market categories like K-pop and by virtue of that music. So here, here to introduce our speaker and share more about this is Mr. Vivek Kota, uh, Koto, excuse me, um, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Media Partners Asia. Uh, Mr. Kato, welcome. Thanks very much. Before we uh, begin our next session, we're just going to play a video to introduce our next company. And uh, let's get that rolling now. Malaysia is like nowhere else. 28 million people made up of Malays, Indian and Chinese, all of whom have their own languages and identity. And for all of them, for all races, languages and ages, they share one source of entertainment. Astro, Malaysia's most successful media group. Over the past five years, our subscriber base has doubled to close to 5 million homes that now enjoy 185 channels. Investment in local content is key to Astra's success, producing in-house over 13,000 hours a year. We don't just have Chinese content, we have Mandarin, Cantonese, and Hokkien. Not just Tamil content, but Hindi, Telugu, and Malaya. For our Malay customers, we cater to all tastes. For international channels, we bring the very best programming from around the world to our viewers. And for sports, no one comes even close to the amount of channels, global live events, and value of our sports pack. We've gone even further, creating our own sports channel for local sports and esports, e commerce, the top nine radio stations in Malaysia, on the go services. VOD, OTT, mm -hmm. digital publications, movies, including the top three films in Malaysian history, and much, much more. Yeah! We started Enjoy, our free satellite service, now with over one and a half million customers. We're also investing in our country's future. We've built hostels for schools, eco-villages, organized community cleaning efforts, provided free decoders and televisions to school systems across the country. And now, in towns and villages all over Malaysia, we identify and nurture young sportsmen and women, giving them the opportunity to train overseas with badminton and football professionals. Engaging and entertaining people is what we do best, but empowering them makes it that much better. We are Astra, Malaysia's most successful media group. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Henry Tan, COO of Astro. Thank you. Well, Henry, thanks very much. I mean, I think for the audience, the, the video summarized Astro um, very well. I think today you have 5 million consumer connections across your pay and um, freeview business. One and a half billion dollars top line. Uh, as I said, more than 13,000 hours of IP created, radio stations. Um, but one of the, the great things about Astro is a proxy for Southeast Asia. And it was interesting when I was looking through your history, I think I met you first six years ago. And at that time, you joined, you changed Astro, uh, even from the brand name, from a platform business to a consumer and content business. And then as we kind of fast forward, you've done the vernacularization, you've created some great local IPs. And as we move forward for the next three years, as I see the industry changing, I kind of look at it from a basis where you have a lot of IP, digital, and commerce. And those are the three key things, I think, for a lot of us over the next few years. And Astro is, is, is kind of a, an interesting intersection across all three. But what's interesting, just looking at this video, is Astro is a marketing platform. How do you see Astro as a marketing platform evolving um, over the next few years? I think foremost, uh, not sure whether we are fortunate or unfortunate, we operate in a marketplace that's incredibly complicated. You're talking about a very small population base of 30 million, multi-ethnic, multilingual, 
unlike other countries. Uh, so if I had to take example, right, 25% of the population is ethnically Chinese, but of that, you can break down one-third Mandarin speaking, one-third Hokkien speaking, one-third Cantonese. And then if you look at the Indian business that we have, that's another 8% segment. So literally, we have four segments of 8% of the consumer marketplace that we have to cater to. And like all consumers, they could be 8%, but they will still demand to have the best of the type of content that they want. The Hokkien's want the best Hokkien, the Indians want the best Indian, the Cantonese want the best Cantonese content. And it's a very colorful marketplace. So I guess from day one, the marketplace has forced us to think marketing, think consumer first. Uh, and that's the reason why we call ourselves a consumer and a content company, because no different from any FMCG, we actually sell entertainment, we sell content, we sell content shows, content packages, right? So we take that view. And I think you asked the point about us being a marketing company. I think that's a really key, key point, key question. Because the, the sad part is the, our peers look at us as a media company. The ad industry tend to look at us with very siloed view. Oh, you are ad sales. And I think it's a shame when people do that because we are not an ad sales company. We are a consumer media marketing company. That means I think if advertisers are smart, they will work to leverage our full capabilities not a 30-second spot, but a, as a group resource, from talents to know-how to insights. You know, we do more research, we understand the consumer marketplace and, and do more of that, probably more than any marketer in the country. Mm. Uh, you look at ground events, on average weekend, we have four events happening per weekend. We do in total of close to 500 events per year. All that to win over the hearts and minds of our consumers and then to earn ourselves you know, the rightful place in, in, in their perception, in their viewing, and obviously, hopefully, in terms of wallet share. Yeah, we'll come back to wallet share in a minute. I mean, what's interesting to me, though, is you've taken that marketing platform a stretch and now driven a home shopping business with your partners, GS. Tell us a little bit more about that, because you're also creating and curating more content for that business. You know, the irony is when we, want to, when we started a home shopping business, there were a lot of uh, advertisers who say, hey, how can you do that? Because soon you are, in a way, might be competing with our traditional retailers and you might be selling some products and brands in competition with us. And I've always looked at them and said, but I thought you, you thought we are not a very effective advertising platform, so why are you worried about that? <laughs> now, if, if you really believe we are a strong advertising platform and home shopping is going to rock the country, then shouldn't you be putting more ad dollars with us? So on one hand, you don't because it's, you know, our share of uh, TV edX is currently we have gone up two points from 35 to 37% share of TV edX, but it's still below the 50% mark of what we think is our rightful share. And, uh, but yet, when it comes to home shopping, they get a bit nervous, right? And you know, our home shopping business is doing well. Uh, we grew by 80 over percent this year over last year. And then you know, we hope that in a few years' time that the business will grow you know, from we should target for 300 million business, and then we hope in a few years' time we build it up to a billion dollar business. You've generally in the last five years operated without fear and, and more out of belief, and that's very hard sometimes in our industry to do. Um, as we look forward to the next three years, you know, you're a publicly held company, and you know, the way I look at Astro is, as you said, you've grown already in the last six months, I think 10%, your, 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 your ad revenue is much higher than the local market. As you think about your business going forward, who are the real challenges to your business? Is it the local free to air? Is it the local OTT? Or is it global technology yeah. slash entertainment disruptors who yeah. may not have the same rational expectations your shareholders do? I think we take a very paranoid view about competition. Foremost, our primary goal is to make sure we serve our customers well and serve them better than anybody can yeah. and therefore earn our share in, in their hearts and minds. Second, in terms of competition, we see anybody, everybody as a competitor. Whether it's somebody in our backyard, whether it's someone from around across the globe, everyone and everyone is our competitor. So as a result, what we do is we measure ourselves across multiple matrices. We are very particular about viewing share. 
thankfully it's been growing healthily. So right now we are about 75% viewing share against our own base. And if you factor the whole country, including those who do not have Astro, we are a 55% viewing share. In terms of number of viewers, again, we are trending up. In terms of time span, which we actually monitor quite closely, every year, year on year, we are increasing. So when people like to shout a lot of numbers, be it OTT players and all, I've got X millions. You know, I think the key question is not just how many customers do you have, but how much time does your customer spend watching, consum consuming content through your service, right? So if you look at our numbers, we are on average four to five hours consumption per day uh, by our customers. And, and that, that number is actually growing steadily year on year. So those are very encouraging numbers. And let's, let's correlate that to share a wallet, though, because they're spending all that time. I saw with Astro on the go, your consumption is up. How does that translate into consumer spend? I ask this because, of course, historically in Malaysia, and correct me if I'm wrong, you had a very strong English audience that paid you a premium. Is that audience coming under pressure? And how do you, as you invest these vast sums into your local IPs, get that to be a premium quality that people want to pay more for? I think the market is changing, changing very fast, in fact. Uh, if I look at the trend today versus five years ago, it's changed. I would say probably five years ago, eight years ago, one could argue that the international content was the super premium content in a way and helping a lot with the ARPU. Today, I would argue that local is a new premium. And I believe that Asian content will be the next wave to really uh, change the marketplace. Uh, and you know, some people say, how, how, on what basis you say that, right? And you know how the marketplace like all this scientific kind of uh, research and all. And I tend to tell them a very simple answer. The next time you go on a long haul flight, walk up and down the aisle and watch what people are watching. This is your premium audience. And you'll be no surprise to see that suddenly there's so much Asian content being consumed by this premium group of air travelers. So local is now the new premium and I think Asian content will be the next wave. And that's certainly, you're seeing that in Korean content and what you want to do over the next two years. I think the Korean content is done really well and I think it will continue to do well at least in the short term. And I foresee that uh, the combination of Korea and uh, China and then to, I guess, to, uh, and, uh, to a lesser extent, maybe even Taiwan and then uh, Hong Kong, I think that part will probably reinvent itself in the next few years. And with the size and uh, f financial power of China uh, and with some Korean know-how and expertise, I think that's the region to look out for. Let's talk about Southeast Asia a bit, because obviously Astro has seen Southeast Asia as, as a neighborhood you, you can talk a little bit about. Um, your OTT service, which is launched in a couple of markets. But what's interesting to me, and again, you know, we have to generalize, but investors like to talk about cycles, so do advertisers. Between 10 and 10, uh, 15, Southeast Asia had a great home run, a very strong macro story. Investors certainly over the last two years, and even media owners, and to some extent advertisers as well, are looking at China and to some extent India as the big blocks. And, and, um, and that's dominating a lot of attention on the radar, a lot of attention on how money gets spent. You've seen the relationship with Korea and China. What does Astro feel like that? Do you feel left out? Do you still see Southeast Asia as a big force? I think two things, right? Regional, global, macro global forces are great. But the reality is your fight and your competition and how you grow your business it's outside your front door. It's a very local thing. And I think the MNCs are going to have a real problem because if they think their fellow competitor is a fellow MNC, I think they really got it wrong. Right. I think they're going to have competition from a lot of local brands. I, I'm now talking about the FMCG yeah. space, right? And there will be the new, uh, new competition that is going to irritate the hell out of the global FMCGs, right? Uh, and you think about it, the global brands have a lot of uh, global might, a lot of efficiencies supporting them with a lot of global know-how. Where they're going to lose out is because when you do too many things at the macro regional level, you lose out of being relevant on ground on a daily basis. 
because that's really where the cash register rings. That's really where the competition is because you need to win the consumer at the local level. And uh, if you speak to a lot of uh, you know, body care, face care, uh, global brands, they will tell you they are being haunted not by a fellow MNC from around the world, but they are being haunted by a, the mushrooming of local brands, right? And, and then that's one. Second thing I think when people look at Asia, they tend to look at China and India, and I think they're really missing the third leg. And third leg is actually Southeast Asia. And historically, if you look back in this whole region, right, Southeast Asia has always been, you know, sandwiched between two very old and strong civilizations, India and China. And the, the fact is Southeast Asia is the influence of these two, you know, historical giants, right? And I think history is making a whole full circle. And uh, hopefully people don't forget when you talk about Asia, there is a third leg and the third leg is Southeast Asia. And it's in that space that we hope to make a difference. Right. And let's, let's talk about Southeast Asia for you. you. You talked about content, creating your own IPs. How is that side of your business expanding outside of Malaysia, which, let's face it, is a mature market and it's a relatively small market, say, relative to Indonesia, where we're seeing the economy coming back and to various other places. Tell us a little bit more about your IP strategy there, your delivery strategy there, what's happening, and how do you see yeah. this marketplace changing? I think we will take a very respectful approach. Uh, we are based in Southeast Asia. We hope to make a strong impact in Southeast Asia, but we are very respectful about our neighboring uh, countries and partners there. So we will expand and grow through partnerships and collaboration. So we have already begun some with Indonesia, some in Singapore. Uh, we'll begin making announcements. Have you heard announcements in Philippines? Uh, in a short while, you'll hear us doing some kind of a collaboration with Korea. Yep. And then after that, you'll hear you know, a whole uh, series of uh, partnerships and collaboration. So the way we believe in moving forward is to work in smart partnerships with like-minded people who share the same views, share the same vision with us, and jointly grow the business. And coming back to Malaysia, we've talked about the power of your marketing platform, of the growth of the Enjoy. Let's talk about the subscription business now, which is a, you know, still a very, very strong business for you. What do you see powering that business from a content perspective over the next year, I've noticed you're experimenting with tiers, with packages. Uh, what are you going to do? Yeah, I think if you look at it, uh, we just announced our first half last yesterday, actually. And if you look in terms of all the numbers and matrices, we are all pointing north, which is very encouraging. So just about every matrix is pointing north. But you can't help a back the overhang. Generally, the mood, not just in Malaysia, in the region, and globally. You know, it's fairly cloudy, yeah. so you do suffer from that overhang. Uh, so I think once we pass that economic uh, so-called soft market conditions, I think we are going to be very good positioned to ride the, the uh, ARPU, uh, ARPU kind of uplift thereafter. But if you look at all the matrices in terms of viewership and engagement, we are really rocking. Uh, just to share some numbers, this year is a major sporting year, and... Uh, I'm not sure how the performance has been for many operators, but it's been great for us. We've seen phenomenal increase in terms of our Euro uh, viewership. We grew by 40% this Euro versus the last Euro in terms of viewers, which is tremendous. And you know, people can say everything about you know, New World, people watching in so many other ways to watch content. The fact is our viewership grew 40%. Then it comes Olympics, which just concluded not too long ago. And we had a phenomenal, not a 40% increase for Olympics, but a 300% increase in viewership, right? Uh, and people ask, how, how did that happen? I think there are a few things. Obviously, Malaysia did well in this uh, Olympics. That obviously helps to put the context. But over and above that, we did a lot of uh, marketing. We did a lot of what I call uh, opportunistic marketing when suddenly someone was doing very well, we changed all our marketing tactics to really capitalize and seize that moment. And then we worked in partnerships with people like Google and all, and created search capabilities because something like Olympics with so many events, people want to know what's happening where and you know, where can I catch that. And all that actually drove up our numbers and we had a phenomenal 12.4 uh, million viewers. And Malaysia is a small country with just under 30 million population. 
and those numbers are staggering. So, two questions, quick questions on the back of that. So, a lot of viewership on your digital platforms, which I guess answers the uh, criticism that maybe Astro has faced in, in recent years that you haven't uh, catered to millennials, as most pay TV companies have. But secondly, is that translating into ad revenues for you? I think the ad revenue market, to be brutal, is uh, falling behind. It's increasing, but I would say the rate of growth, I mean, you talk about we had 10% growth against the industry backdrop, which is negative. So obviously, you know, everybody yeah. say, hey, you guys are doing very well. When we go out to the industry, it's incredible. Everybody's having negative, you are the one 10%. But if we're going to be brutal about that, I think even that 10% is behind our actual performance because if you look at our viewership growth, it's phenomenal. So a 10% increase in edX, whereas our viewership has gained like what, 20, 25%, 40, and even at times double in terms of our viewership, right? Because a lot of our new IPs are really resonating. I think some years back when we spoke, we talked about our IPs crossing a million mark. Today, we're not even looking at a million mark in terms of viewership. Our signature shows today are hitting close to 4 million. That's, that's you know, from 1 to 4 million now, we're, we're talking new numbers. And I'm setting a new benchmark for my team that, hey, if you're under 3 million, don't bore me with those numbers, right? I want to know how many shows you have that are above 3 million. So we're pushing the envelope, we're pushing. So the truth is, I think, whilst we are growing in edX, it's still behind our actual performance. And that's my key point to a lot of uh, clients that I meet. I say, I know you're investing more with us, but truth be told, it's behind our actual growth. You should be actually putting a lot more with us. When do you uh, see the us. catch up? You see, the sad thing in the ad industry, it's a bit like the scheduled linear business. If you take a critical view about planning, people plan and buy and book the space in advance. Olympics, for example. And then when you look at the results, we had a 300% increase. Now, I could tell a lot of advertisers out there, hey, you miss a golden opportunity, and those who are with us now benefited with a tremendous uh, performance. But on the other hand, from a monetization point of view, we have actually kept 30 seconds at whatever rate. But I think the industry needs to take a more proactive view whereby we start to move by results rather than I guess and estimate what you perform, I buy the spots in advance, you know. We, we need to evolve to a result-based incentive rather than buying a 30-second rates pre and then, you know, pre-scheduled. I, I think that, that's a flawed model today, yeah. Um, last couple of questions before we wrap up. You, you kind of hinted at this, but let, let's come back to it. As you try and grow that subscription pie, uh, you're about at 100 rigid ARPU per month, and say so it goes up north over the next five years. What are the kind of things that keep you awake at night? I mean, you, we alluded it to before, global technology and media companies, maybe not necessarily competing with you in Malaysia, but competing with you for content. Chinese companies rolling out technology delivery systems that you could capitalize on, but could potentially disrupt you as well. It's all about scale. Do you have enough scale in this region? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're a small country, and uh, like I said earlier, we, we, we paranoid about all kinds of competition from anybody and everybody is a competitor. And I always say, you know, competitors range from sharks to piranhas. Yeah. And I think you've got to be more fearful of the piranhas because, you know, they come in a shoal and they, you know, they kind of like eat you up slowly but surely, right? So what we believe is uh, we will continue to invest in IPs and we, you know, if you think about it, today, three out of the top five local box office come from us. And all that happened within only the last three years. Right. So if we go on the trajectory and keep on doing that, I, I think it's a positive note for us. And we're not planning to do it just by ourselves. You know, we have been reaching out, working in partnership with a lot of other people. Uh, right now, we're not announcing any of that. But, you know, watch the space in the next few months. You will hear a lot of announcements of smart partnerships and collaboration. And hopefully that helps us in terms of scale and distribution. And I think it's going to be a win-win partnership for all. Henry Tan, thank you very much. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you.